Hello, everyone. Welcome to JRB Live. Um, today, it's just me because um, I did my book for cover reveal. And I'm so excited about it. If you have not seen it, it is in the thumbnail of this video. And um, I have posted all over my social media, which is J. Reese Bradley on on all of them. Pretty much I'm only, I, I stay to Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I am on TikTok. I don't like TikTok. I'm sorry, guys. Um, I'm trying to get this to where my window things aren't on my face, but I don't think it's going to happen. So that's fine. Anyway, how are you guys doing? Did y'all have a great Thanksgiving? I did. And of course I am a little bigger than I was last week, but that's okay. Anyway, um, so a couple things first. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about all things Brumbletide. You are going to know about the first three in case you don't. And also, um, you're going to find out what book four is all about and why it is being released on, not released, but why the cover reveal is uh, revealed on C.S. Lewis's birthday. So first things first, it is C.S. Lewis's birthday. Happy birthday, Mr. Lewis. But also it is um, my brother's 50th birthday today. So happy birthday to Jimmy. He is turning 50 today. If you do not follow um, Dancing With Ourselves, a totally rad 80s podcast, head on over to your favorite podcast um, platform and follow DWO. They are so funny. It is my two brothers, Jimmy and Eric, and our neighbor, Josh Rackley, when we were kids, all talking about the 80s. And it is so good. So follow them. Also, my youngest brother, Walt, opened um, a gun store on Black Friday, and it is so amazing if you are in the Bethlehem, Georgia area. Head over to Whiskey Charlie's Armory. It is so good. I'm so proud of him. Um, he is so knowledgeable, so um, go check out their selection. They don't have just guns, of course. They have knives, um, a flamethrower, like all these crazy things, but um, just go check it out. It's awesome. Whiskey Charlie Armory. And if you want to follow them on social media, that's um, how you'll find them. Whiskey Charlie Armory. So um, congratulations to both of my brothers, one for turning 50 and the other for opening his gun store. It's so awesome. Anyway, okay. Brumble Tide. So in case you have not read Brumble at all, I'm just going to give you the breakdown of what it's about. So so far, there are three in the series published. If you're wondering why I'm wearing this crown today, it is be you're going to find out. Anytime there is a Brumble something special, I wear this crown because um, you're going to find out why. Because Brumble is about a bunch of royals, okay? They're not really royals. Some are, but some are not. Okay, so there's there's three books in the series so far. The first is Brumble Tide and the Daughter of Eve. The second is um, Brumble Tide and the Changing of the Crowns, the blue one. And the third in the series is Brumble Tide and the Triad Champion. Um, and then the purple one with the Sparrow, Brumble Tide and the Queen's Doctor's Story will be out May 2023. So that's just what was. It's basically December, January, February, March, April, May. Five months. Six months. Anyway, it'll be here before you know it. And it's so exciting. Um, and I can't wait to tell you about Queen's Doctor's story. First, though, for those of you um, who have not read Brumble, I'm just going to give you the um, what it's about. Um, also, my voice is kind of gone. I mean, it's not gone, but it's just kind of squeaky. So I apologize. Um, and I usually sound a little better than this. I hate my voice, but I do kind of sound a little better than this sometimes. Okay. Book one, Rumble Tide and the Daughter of Eve. It has this 
precious little Warmouth, who we meet in the story. His name is Magnus, um, but the story is not, he is not the protagonist. If you are not in the writing world, the protagonist is your main character, okay? Our main character is Maggie Pruitt. She is 12 when the book begins and then 13 when the book is over. Um, and she lives in an average small town called Little Ipswich um, in England. And um, I made that place up. There is an Ipswich, but I made up Little Ipswich because I love that name. Anyway, so Maggie lives in Ipswich and everything is totally normal about Little Ipswich. Um, total cute precious little town, normal in every way, except three miles out in the Lux Sea, L-U-X-C-S-E-A, is this massive, miraculous castle where the general public can come and be treated as royalty for free-ish, okay? So everybody can go, younger, young or old, rich or poor, they can go have their own throne, their own royal feast, to be called your majesty. And then if you want to pay, you can get your gown, your crown, um, even join the school, the, um, the castle's academy that it has called Emily Academy. The name of the castle is Emily Castle. So Maggie, she um, is not from a wealthy family. She is from a um, pretty less than average family. Um, they don't eat at the table. They're very like, you know, just not, not Instagram type family. Okay. Um, her mother is very self-absorbed. Her dad is working all the time and, um, they are not, they are not the picture of, they're just not a picture perfect family. Right. So, um, Maggie, in the beginning of the book, they're all eating dinner in the living room, as they do all the time. And um, Maggie's dad has been wanting to watch this horror, mo this horror movie. And it's about this little boy that um, is like every time that he's around, whoever he's around, they end up dying a terrible death. And so Maggie's watching it and she's creeped out by it and something's just weird about the movie. So um, she doesn't want to ask her mother because her mother loves to um, give terrible, terrible news and, <laughs> and kind of takes pleasure in um, scaring people and giving them bad news. So um, she's too creeped out by the movie and ends up asking her mom, like, what is this movie about and why is it so creepy? And her mom says, um, this movie is actually based on a true, uh, prophecy in Pippin's puzzle. Okay. So, uh, the whole town knows about this book that comes from Emily Castle called Pippin's puzzle. They know about it. Okay. Um, everybody knows about Emily, whether they go or not. Um, everybody knows about Pippin's puzzle, whether they have read it or not. Um, and so Maggie's mom reads her this kind of doomsday prophecy from Pippin's puzzle. And Maggie is just terrified. She's terrified. Um, it seems like the end of the world is coming soon. And so she begs her mother to take her to Emily Castle because she figures there at least I can figure out what this prophecy is about, maybe get some comfort and, um, you know, ease her nerves about, you know, this movie she saw and this prophecy she's now terrified of. So her mother and um, and her she goes with her mother and her brother to the castle. They ride the ferry, which is a magical boat that kind of looks like a floating um, uh, cozy cabin with a thatched roof and chimney and all of this. Um, it has little nooks inside. Everything is absolutely wonderful and perfect and um, and cozy and um and she loves it she loves it maggie's mom loves it uh wes her brother loves it she loves it um she loves the staff that works there they go to the castle and are just wowed by you know all of these royals everywhere because everyone is treated like royalty so everyone there has fabulous gown, um, beautiful crown. Um, Maggie and her mother are being called your majesty, but they do not have the crown and gown because they can't afford it. Okay. So, um, they go to the ceremony where, um, they hear from the, 
um, here from the castle. And, you know, um, Maggie's mother just gets sucked into this whole fabulous lifestyle of the castle. And um, they, they end up leaving um, with one, one person dressed royally, and that's Maggie's mother. Anyway, um, the castle talks her in to um, getting the royal garments, you know, and becoming part of this um, beautiful lifestyle. And then she also gets talked into enrolling Maggie into the castle's academy, where young people are groomed into their royal destiny, um, where they do, they do not have, um, Maggie's family does not have the money to send their children to this academy, but uh, the castle makes a deal with them. They can make payments. Um, Maggie's mother decides, you know, okay, Maggie, even though she's underage, she can get a job and we can afford it. We can make it work. And everybody's going to think we're awesome because um, we will, we will have children, one child in the academy. And uh, Maggie's mother, of course, now looks like a royal of Emily. Questions. Um, just anytime you have a question, just um, ask it. I'll see it in the chat and I will answer it. So, so Maggie, like it or not, becomes part of Emily, Emily, Emily Castle, sorry, um, Academy. And, um, and there they live at the castle most of the year. So now Maggie does get to have her crown and gown that she really wanted at this point. The castle is so magical. It has um, all of these flying children all around it uh, called snickerlings. They fly and sing and they sing in tune to what you want to hear. So everybody hears um, a different song from them and it's the fa their favorite song. Um, there's also uh, one little one little magical creature named Magnus. He is the flying pig on the book, and he get, becomes Maggie's little um, friend. And um, the little flying creatures are called Warmouths. There are more Warmouths throughout the story, but at um, at this point, we just meet Magnus. So anyway, um, long story, extremely short. It's not that long. It's you know, not that long. Um, long story, extremely short. Maggie um, becomes part of this academy. She realizes, she comes to realize or to find out that she is a daughter of one of the seven highly esteemed, highly esteemed ancestors um, named Eve. So she is a daughter of Eve. There's seven highly esteemed ancestors whom everyone thinks are dead because they lived 700 years ago. So of course they would be dead. Um, and Maggie finds out that her great, great, great many times over grandmother is Eve. So that automatically gives her um, a leg up in the castle. She's now looked at with prestige and all this, but um, as she is in this castle more and more, she realizes there is something sinister going on. And eventually, um, Eventually, she is going to make her way to the castle's basement, where she is going to find a um, a a magical snow globe, a big magical snow globe. Okay, um, that has what looks like a miniature um, Emily inside. But when she goes inside, it turns out that in this snow globe, that's called the Axiom, is Brumbletide Kingdom. And it has been hidden in the basement the whole time. And um, there she is going to meet those seven ancestors. No, six ancestors at this point because that's a big um, thing you realize. I won't give that part away. But you meet six of the ancestors in the Axiom. Um, that's Pippin's kingdom. It's the true good kingdom. And Emily, all of this time, when all of... All of the town thinks that this castle is just the peak of prestige and, you know, that it is um, the, the picture of righteousness and good, that it has just been a cheap imitation and actually a wicked, a wicked imitation of the true kingdom, Brumbletide, this whole time. So um, now it is Maggie's job to bring Brumbletide to the people, to out Emily and let everyone know this is not 
um, this is not the true kingdom. You're all worshiping yourselves here and you're treating yourselves as royalty. Um, and in Brumbletide, the, the, uh, the six ancestors, seven ancestors, they are uh, royalty as well. They're Queen Eve. King Justice, King George, Queen Salil, okay, and they're dressed royally because they are, they were chosen to be uh, royals, okay, but um, what's different about the Brumble Tide Kingdom, no one is out for themselves, they're servant kings and queens, and um, and that's where it's at, when you are, um, when you are living as a servant, um, that's true royalty, that's, that's true goodness, and um, and Maggie has to bring this good kingdom to the people. So that is the first book, Brumbletide and the Daughter of Eve. And um, it just kind of, you know, sets everything up, lays the stage, everything. She meets the ancestors that were, you know, long thought dead. Well, they're not. And they are in... Um, they are in Rumble Tide and they have stones that if those stones are in their crowns, they can actually leave the Axiom, leave Rumble Tide and go to Emily and not die. Okay, but they are 700 years old. So if they leave the Axiom without those stones, um, they, they will die. Okay, so anyway, Maggie has found the stones at this point in book two. Um, they are getting ready to have a changing of the crown ceremony where Maggie will now be head of castle. Okay, and um, but but right before everything gets switched over and she is crowned um, head of castle, uh, the, the stones of the ancestors are stolen and they are suddenly, you know, aging rapidly, about to die. They have to get back to the Axiom and Maggie has to then figure out how to get them, get the stones back and get them out. So that's book two. And then book three <coughs> is a very perilous, perilous games that happen at Emily every 12 years. So Maggie is head of castle. She is in charge of this um, in charge of the M games this year, and they have extremely dangerous, deadly, um, deadly events. And um, Maggie has to not only lead these games, but she has to compete. And she is not athletic at all. She is not co coordinated. She is not competitive, and she does not want to do it. And so this book is very. Um, hilarious and um <laughs> um it's it's got a lot of hilarious moments but um but as these books progress you realize more and more how wicked Emily is and how good Brumble Tide is so we um we you know really go into that more here in case um you don't know I've talked about this before but in case you don't know the magic from um, Emily, it turns out, comes from slain snickerlings. So those magical flying children um, that are flying around and singing beautifully and um, they're just serving and helping everyone. It turns out that Emily is getting its magic and it's able to float in the sea um, when they are killed and when their wings are taken. And so at the end of the M Games, tradition holds that uh, while usually one time a year, um, one snickerling is killed for Emily. Um, this year, seven are chosen. And so um, Maggie uh, is just losing her mind. She has to stop that. So uh, read it and see what happens. And yes, so, um, so that's the rundown of the first three books. And um, book four is going to be out in May, and it is called Brumble Tide and the Queen's Doctor's Story. And I'm so excited about this book. Every single time I write another one, I say the, the latest one, I say this one's the best one, <laughs> you know, because I just, um, I, I, I think you just get better as a writer. And then two, um, uh, you just get excited over the new ideas. So um, four 
book four, which you, obviously it's not published yet. It will be, uh, it will release in May of next year, 2023. So not too far away. It'll be here before you know it. But um, um, it is called Brumbletide and the Queen's Doctor Story. And the reason um, that it, that I released the cover, uh, showed everybody the cover on, um, on C.S. Lewis's birthday is because, um, well, one, C.S. Lewis, uh, influenced Brumbletide in so many ways. Um, obviously the first one is called Daughter, Daughter of Eve, um, Brumbletide and the Daughter of Eve. It is not, um, it is not taking from Sons of Adam and Daughters of Eve. It's just a play on words that, um, obviously Maggie is a daughter of the ancestor Eve. Okay. So, um, but it, obviously it was an influence. Um, also I love, um, magical doorway stories. Okay. So obviously I'm a huge Potter fan, um, Narnia and, um, and of course, you know, Brumbletide has the magical doorway, the axiom. There's several magical doorways, um, throughout the three books that are published already. And so, um, I definitely took influence from Lewis and Narnia in the magical doorway. Also, um, also Narnia, uh, C.S. Lewis said that Narnia was not an allegory. It is, um, it's a supposal. Okay. And that is true for Brumbletide as well. It is not an allegory. It is a supposal. Okay, so there's no mention of um, Jesus, God, you know, um, um, anything like that. Okay, it's strictly fantasy. Uh, but where Lewis said, you know, suppose, suppose there was a place called Narnia that was in need of redemption. Um, how would that how would that play out? And then he has Aslan and he has the Pavinci children and um and all of that, you know, Narnia being redeemed. Um, and so anyway, uh, that Brumbletide is a supposal. Suppose there was a place that was um, so close to the truth, so close to goodness, but because it's twisted just enough, it misses the whole point and um, is actually, in fact, wicked now. Okay. And that is what Rumble Tide, I'm not Rumble Tide, that's what Emily is. It is a uh, imitation. It is close to the truth, but it's twisted just enough to make it all um, completely wicked. Okay. And um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, where I got those influences a little bit. Let me take a sip of this coffee because my voice is going. I'm so sorry, guys. But where I got the influences um, for Brumble, um, for Emily, okay? Um, when you guys know my testimony, um, you know, I, I, I called myself a Christian for a very long time um, before I actually was one. Um, I said I believed in Jesus. I um, went to church. I listened to sermons, um, would do devotionals. Um, to, you know, even in my own mind, I was a Christian, um, and, and I don't know, I don't know if others would call me a Christian. Anyway, the, I had missed the point because it was all about myself. It was all about, um, bettering myself, getting my prayers answered, getting my plans blessed, um, you know, I had not at all read the Bible for one thing or submitted to the Lord. Um, I had my ideas of what, um, what, what a good life is and, um, what was good for me. And I asked God to give me those things. And, uh, the problem with that is that if you're not submitting to God, if you're not, if you don't know what the gospel is, first of all, I didn't, I didn't even know what the gospel was. I didn't even listen to it because I was so busy trying to get blessings, you know, 
if you don't know what the gospel is, if you're not reading the Bible and know it as a whole unified story leading to Jesus, then you're missing the whole point and you're not converted. You're not saved. You're not a Christian, you know? Um, and the reason that's so important is because while it seems like being out for yourself and getting blessings for yourself and um, having your plans work out for you, while it seems like that's a good life and going to lead to a good life, is not. It's not. Once you, once you have the gospel and good soil in your heart and once you know um the, know the gospel once what's once that is in good soil in your heart and you start Christ starts bearing that that fruit that fruit of the spirit through you that's the good life that's the good life and that is what you want that's what you want um and and you know you know so many times um Sometimes pastors preach this. Sometimes, you know, we just choose to believe this, even though they're not um, preaching this. You know, a pastor could preach the gospel, but yet we're still trying to, you know, just make it all about ourselves. And um, and that's not what we want. That's not what we want. Because in actuality, the good life is when you know the gospel, it's you're you're born that way. Everybody is born some way, you know, everybody is born in a way that leads to everything that's going on in the world right now. You know, everything that you look and see that is not right in the world, we're all born contributing to that. And what Jesus does is when you believe that he paid the price for that, paid the price for um, punishment that we should get for, for contributing to all this sin, um, then, um, you don't do it. You don't, you don't do anything. You don't try to be different. Um, you just become a new creation. You just become different, you know, and that is that good life that you want. You don't want to keep, keep trying to, um, you know, have, have, you know, the money and the cars and the, all this stuff that seems like this is what you need in the world. Um, you want that fruit of the spirit inside of you. And that only comes in when you know what Christ did for you on the cross and rose again, um, paying for um, the punishment that we all deserve because we are contributing to the death of this world. Okay. All of us are the problem. We're all the problem with this world. And so when we accept that Jesus paid a price so that we don't have to live like that, he changes us inside and everything without us even trying, your thoughts, your feelings, everything about you um, starts, starts becoming more in the image of God. And that is the truth. And that is the good life. Um, it is good to be a servant. It is a blessing to be a servant. Um, and that is, that is the truth. And so when we have whole churches, when we have pastors, when we have just people that are um, lying and saying, you know, that it's the, the things that we do. It's all about us, you know, it's about being blessed and it's about, um, being, um, uh, just about having things and having your best life now. Um, the way to go about having your best life is by submitting to Christ and having his gospel and good soil in your heart. That's the truth. And, um, and that is if every single body, if every single person, um, understood the gospel, had it in good soil in their heart, became that new creation, the Holy spirit is, is bearing fruit through them. The world would not be bad anymore. It would be heaven. And so, um, as long as I'm on this earth, I want, um, everyone who is thinking they're a Christian or is not a Christian, I want you to know that the gospel is what's going to change the world and make it into, um, this place that everyone is trying to 
get to with kindness and be kind and be inclusive and be all these things, but that isn't going to help. The only thing that's going to help is submitting to Christ, receiving the gospel and good soil in your heart and letting him make you a new creation. The more of these new creations we have, the better the world's going to be. And that's the truth. So, um, so that is my inspiration for writing Rumble Tide. Um, of course, you know, um, uh, the, the story, um, the king of Rumble Tide is a white stag named Pippin, which, um, I took as influence from C.S. Lewis as well. Um, in, in, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in chapter 14, there's the hunting of the white stag. And um, and a, the, a white stag, the P Pavinci children kind of see this white stag and he um, kind of tricks them into leaving um, Narnia. And so I thought, what if that is actually kind of a, an appearing of Aslan? And he's leading them out of Narnia for his purposes because it, the time hasn't come or whatever. So I took the white stag um, because the white stag is um, is not just Lewis's. That is something that has been in myth throughout, you know, centuries. I took the white stag. I named him Pippin. I gave him his kingdom of Brumble Tide. And, um, and yeah, so he, um, he chose seven seven people to help build his kingdom and book four rumble tide and the queen's doctor's story um is you're going to find out so much more about those seven okay so for those of you who have read the series um you know up until now in the in the books they've been called the ancestors because they um, are 700 years old. They have lots and lots of descendants after them. Um, but in, in this book, we're going to hear a story from the Queen's Doctor. So at the end of um, Triad Champion, we know that um, Maggie has an accident and she is now in the hospital recovering. And the Queen's Doctor is... Um, is taking care of her. And so, um, you know, at Emily and in Brumble Tide, since everyone is a royal, everyone goes by um, king, queen, um, prince or princess. The way I laid it out was if you are 17 or younger, you are a prince or a princess. And if you are over 17, then you are um, a queen or a king. So Maggie is Princess Maggie. Atticus is Prince Atticus. Um, um, Callista is Princess Callista, but like Anastasia is Queen Anastasia. And, um, the, the teachers at the Academy are called the Queen Mothers. So we have Queen Mother Berthilda, Queen Mother Erlene, you know, um, those are the teachers of the Academy, Queen Mother Steori. So, um, so we find out more about the ancestors, but in Rumble Tide and the Queen's Doctor's story, they're going to be called the Chosen because um, we are going to be back in where they actually became, where they were actually chosen and became the kings and queens of their houses. And you're going to find out all about their former lives, which are, it's going to surprise you a lot. Um, you'll find out more about their uh, former lives, how um, they uh, have descendants, how um, how Sarah Lisa got the eye patch, how Flory lost three, uh, lost two fingers. And, um, and yeah, you're going to find out so many secrets that have been lingering throughout the series so far. And I'm so excited, but okay. Back to C.S. Lewis. Um, the queen's doctor is, um, a character called King Jaxi. Okay. So the queen's doctor of Emily castle is um king jacksy and he is um taking care of maggie and he is also he loves stories and he is going to tell maggie a story and it is going to be about the ancestors and pippin and how the axiom came about and all of it so um if you don't know um c.s lewis's nick nick nickname with his friends was 
Jaxi. And um, so that's how I came up with the name um, King Jaxi for the Queen's Doctor. And then um, I took influence from my favorite C.S. Lewis book, The Great Divorce. Um, if you haven't read that book, you have got to read it. I currently don't have it. I've bought it so many times and then I let people borrow it or I let people have it or I get, give it as a gift. <laughs> and um, right now I don't have it, but I've had it so many times. Um, it's so good. It's about a, um, it's about the people in hell taking a field trip to heaven for the day and nobody wants to go in. Okay. Um, and it's so good. You have to read it. Anyway, in that book, um, in heaven, uh, one of the characters meets George MacDonald, who is one of C.S. Lewis's um, influences. He just had a huge respect for George MacDonald. He wrote a whole book of George MacDonald quotes. Um, and so that can be the idea of, you know, putting my influence in the book as a character. And so that's how I came up with um, King Jaxi. And he is taking care of Maggie. And he is going to be the one um, informing her on the past of the chosen, the ancestors. And so I love that. Anyway, okay, well, I don't think we have any questions today. Is there um is there anything, if there's anything else that you guys would like to know, um, just hit me up. Hit me up on social media. Um, you can comment on this video. Um, I appreciate you guys watching. I know these are really long, but um, I love to talk. And that's probably why my voice is gone. But um, I wrote down a few things to make sure that I didn't forget. Um, if you would like to... Um, get Rumble Tide for Christmas for a young reader that you know or an adult that just likes to read middle grade fantasy like I do. Um, you can find them on on Amazon. So just Google Rumble Tide, not Google Rumble Tide, but search Rumble Tide, and they're all eight ninety nine. And um, yeah, so I hope you guys enjoy it. I will keep you posted on when um, book four is going to be out the specific day. That is another influence that I took from C.S. Lewis and uh, the, ma the Magician's Nephew was, um, was um, published in May, I think it was May 2nd. So I wanted, I wanted um, book four to be published at the same time as a C.S. Lewis book, as you know, or you probably don't know. Anyway, I said this at, I think the one year anniversary of Daughter of Eve, but, um, Brumble Tide and the Daughter of Eve was published 70 years after um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So thank you so much for watching, you guys. Thank you so much for your support. Um, I just, I can't thank you enough. I love, I love talking about these books. I love when you read them. I love when you review them. Um, and I love when you guys come to the bookstores. So um, I'm going to have another event coming up uh, for book four. Um, and I'll just keep you guys posted. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I hope you guys have a great start to your Christmas season. And please tune in on Thursday um, for Jen and Joe Robertson, the, um, the authors of The Wonderful Wandering Wagon, a great, a great middle fantasy that your kids are going to love. All right, guys, blessings. I'll talk to you soon.